and welcome back to the Money Advantage podcast. This is Rachel Marshall and Bruce Weiner. And before we get started in this show, I want to tell you two things. One is that today we're talking about terms and definitions again. And you might say, this is so boring. I want to tune out. I want to tell you that words matter and we are building a strong foundation for your understanding of infinite banking based on the fundamentals that we can clearly identify and define so that we can build a strong system. That's what we're talking about today. And before we dive in, please put your questions in the comments section. If you're watching live, we love to hear your engagement, your questions, your thoughts. This could be a question about anything as broad as money in general. It could be as specific as a particular part of infinite banking. So I want you to feel the freedom to share your money questions with us because we want to be able to address those in a way that can help you get the clarity you need to make decisions and move forward in your financial life. So please drop in your comments in the live stream. If you're watching later and this is no longer live, we love your questions and comments as well. So go ahead and put those comments into the comments section of where you're watching. You can share this episode with anyone that you feel would be benefited by having a strong foundation to really understand the philosophy of financials in their life and really have a strong philosophy of money. And you also can like this video as well. That helps more people like you who are looking for solid, sound financial decision-making information to be able to find out more and be able to make those decisions better. So Bruce, good morning and thank you for joining me today. Good morning. I think that was a really good uh, introduction because I see this all the time when we're talking to clients or potential clients, they have this aha moment just because you um, defined a word for them a certain way or a phrase for them a certain way. And they'll say things like, oh, now I understand what you're what you're talking about because of this. It's also because of the TikTok and the Instagram generation that's out there that say things about 90% correct, but about 10% is not correct. And it's because they're not using the proper words or word or phrasing um, in that situation. So that's why we're so adamant about going through the glossary of terms in Nelson's book, because words really do matter to, to grasp this. And the last thing before we get started, you know, I, I see people over overcomplicating this. It's a not a product, it's a process. So really people shouldn't be worried, well, which mutual company should I use? I mean, I do believe that some of the mutual companies are a little bit better, but not because of their product, but because of their their process at the company, I think is better. Um, they shouldn't be worried about the rates of returns or the dividends or anything like that. Um, we really should be worried about the process and words and phrases actually help you understand the process. Bruce, I feel like this is bringing so many threads together for me, even just as I'm considering and processing homeschooling kids. And something that is really clear to me is that we're studying right now with my older daughter, the difference between fact and opinion and making sure that you recognize that in any literature that you're reading. And it's very important that you are not just listening to financial opinions, you're listening to financial fact. And it can feel like it's challenging to hear the difference, especially when a lot of times people share opinions as facts, but it's very critical for you to be able to have a strong, solid foundation based on actual tangible reality so that you can have a concept of how to think about money and you can develop your thinking in a logical progression and not just be guessing or gathering opinions from a lot of different people and then trying to formulate your opinion based on their opinions, which is very confusing. So there's another term that I've heard called linguistic theft. And this is specifically when you have a word that is used in a particular way, and then later that word is twisted or changed or modified to mean something different. And we can see this in the dictionary, and you don't have to go very far to look at words that did have different uses in old literature, even children's um, nursery rhymes. And then now all of, all of a sudden, because of our culture and um, just the traditional 
trajectory and the trends, words have changed in meaning. And so you can say a word, and I'm I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole just because I think there there's so much value to understanding what words have been stolen and co-opted. But at the same time, I, I want to make sure that we stay on track for the financial focus and not get onto a tangent. But when you look at a specific word, you could have a different meaning than what somebody else is hearing, not just because you have a difference of opinion and history and experience, but because simply you have a different definition of that word. And I love that Nelson was so specific and clear and exacting. Um, one of my favorite terms we're going to get to in just a moment that he uses classification, because if you can truly classify something, you can understand it. And we want to make sure that as Nelson is laying out an understanding of infinite banking. He's very clear about what exactly those terms mean. He's not leaving you to guess or to grab at some loose definition that he's laying out. He's not just saying, here's my message, but he's also saying, here's how to interpret my message. And here's the fundamentals and the building blocks so that you can have clarity on exactly what I meant. And that's why we're covering the glossary of terms and we're not glossing over the end matter of this book. So Bruce, anything else you want to say before we jump into the first term? No, I think we're good. All right. Co-generation is Nelson's word that we're going to jump into first. And this is a term that he uses earlier in the book to talk about the um, a, a energy plant that is not only producing energy, but that there are systems within that energy plant that are using and producing energy as well. So I'm going to lay out his definition as Nelson Nash defines it. This is not the dictionary definition as we defined before. Some of his words are the dictionary definition with Oxford's dictionary. Some are Nelson's own definitions. This is his own. A term used in the production of electrical power, acknowledging the fact that there are many sources of the generation of power within the distribution system, many of whom are both producers and consumers of power. So he's looking at a whole model of power and recognizing that there are some components that are producing and consuming power at the same time. Not only is there one big unit producing one final output of power, there are also other producers and consumers of power within that system that has an end product of creating power. Yeah, and if you look at this from a scientific viewpoint, um, it's it's called conservation of energy. So uh, energy is never created nor destroyed. It just transfers from one place to another. And so uh, I think what he's trying to relate this to from his electrical is that everything is going to both have some benefits and some detra detraction from it. And you must uh, make a value judgment from that um, same way with a mutual life insurance company that you're going to use for the process of banking. Um, example, uh, you're going to get better uh, treatment of that money at a mutual life insurance company than you are at a bank. However, you are going to give up some liquidity early on in that situation. So that would be like you're producing something, but then you're consuming something that consumption is a lack of, of liquidity in that process. So that's, that is always trying to say in this is that you need to look at uh, everything from uh, both lenses of producing and consuming. Let's go into the next definition. And this is classification, probably one of my favorite definitions in this whole section, this whole glossary. So I'm going to share with you the Webster's Third New International Dictionary definition of classification that is written in this book. It is from Webster. The act of grouping into classes that have systematic relations usually founded on common properties. You classify things on the basis of their major characteristics. A life insurance... Okay, so let me um, stop for a moment. The first sentence is Webster's definition. The parenthesis is Nelson adding to that. So I'm going to share Webster's definition again. The act of grouping into classes that have systematic relations usually founded on common properties. Then he adds in, this is in parentheses, you classify things on the basis of their major characteristics. A life insurance policy with a mutual dividend paying company is a gross 
misclassification of a financial instrument. It has much more in concept in common with the concept of banking. Now, the reason this is one of my favorite definitions that he lays out is that when we think about anything at all, we have to understand what bucket it goes into. I mean, kids as young as one and a half years old, as soon as they can pick things up, start liking the idea of classifying. They pick up rocks and they put rocks in a rock pile. They pick up leaves, they organize leaves. They think about pine cones and those go in a pine cone bucket. They're, they're thinking about here are different flowers that grow and they're classifying according to something that they can control and they can identify the world by. Then as adults, we have this classification. We look at houses and those are a classification. We can look at asset classes. Those are different buckets of ways that we can invest. And when we think about anything, we conceptualize what it is organized along with based on what we already know. And that's how we can assimilate a lot of new information and new ideas. So when it comes to life insurance, there is a very great challenge that Nelson lays out in this entire book, Becoming Your Own Banker. And I'll just show this in case you are coming to us for the first time. This is the book we're covering by Nelson Nash. Life insurance is called life insurance. But when we think of it just as a life insurance product, it is challenging for us to have a proper construct, a proper mental construct about this product because we're classifying it in the category of other insurance products, just where you're transferring risk, you're going to get a payout if something happens. And Nelson is not saying it's not insurance. It certainly is insurance. But what we need to be able to do is classify whole life insurance that's dividend paying insurance with a mutual company in a different bucket. And he's saying the different bucket that we should be conceptualizing life insurance of that nature into is in the process of banking. And when we do that and banking, according to what we discussed previously, is any other associated form or, of dealing in money or credit. Specifically, the business of a bank originally restricted to money changing and now devoted to taking money on deposit to check and draft and then loaning money and credit and any other form of dealing in money or credit. So when when you think of whole life insurance, dividend paying, whole life insurance with a mutual company as a process of banking, you're now able to see the true um, potential and the true way it's able to be used in your life as a banking system to be able to store capital and then earn the rewards or the interest and dividends of storing that capital and being able to build a banking system in your life. Yeah, as a... As a um... Uh, former biology teacher, you know, the greatest classification class person that did classification was Charles Darwin. Mm. And the reason you do that is so that you bring greater clarity to, to a smaller and smaller subset. So when you, in this, in this situation, we would be saying insurance would be the, the, the largest subset. And then off of the insurance, you have different subsets off of that. And what it's such as PNC and uh, liability insurance and um, disability insurance, health insurance, and of course, life insurance. And then off of life insurance, then you're going to have the different types of life insurance, term, whole life, universal life, you know, and then off of the whole life, you're going to uh, get even smaller. You're going to get to uh, mutual life, uh, whole life insurance companies, not and stock life insurance companies. And then from the mutual ones, you're going to get ones that are uh, direct recognition and non-direct recognition um, companies. So you're you're going down the classification system in that. And then finally, Nelson is saying that um, through that system, you're also going to get to where uh, banking is part of that process because of the other uh, classifications that you've already worked through to get to that banking process. And so classification is very, very important when you're trying to determine which type of insurance company you're going to use. And that's that's what, basically what he's talking about for, as far as classification. All right, Bruce, let's go into contingency fund. This is Nelson Nash's definition. He shares the amount that an insurance company retains as surplus after paying death claims, expenses, and dividends to policyholders. 
This is a significant measure of the strength of that particular company and an indication of its ability to pay dividends in the future. Boy, if there's not a lot wrapped into that definition, I don't know what is. So let's break it down a little bit. The amount that a life insurance or that an insurance company retains as surplus after paying death claims, expenses, and dividends to policyholders. So we're talking about the insurance company, their balance sheet, not yours. So we're looking at the internal financial system of the insurance company, and they're taking, um, they're taking in premiums, and then they're using those premiums to create a growth in the future. So based on their uh, growth rates, they also, or, um, sorry, based on the way that they're investing or using or plugging those dollars into some type of mechanism, whether that is they're putting money into stocks, they're um, holding bonds, most of it is in government bonds, they're holding hard assets, they're in a position that they're thinking long-term with that capital, that's the growth side. Then there's going to be expenses that are coming out and their greatest expenses are paying death claims. And then once they have all of the expenses come out, they have a contingency fund. Bruce, I'm sure you're gonna add additional clarity to this. So they have money coming in, they have money that's going to growth, they have expenses. And once those expenses are paid, they have a contingency fund that they're holding after they have all of their money coming out. And so they're even saying the contingency fund is after they have paid all of their dividends to policyholders. So when you're looking at that contingency fund, the capital that they're holding in reserves in that company, they're able to have a measure of financial strength that we can see through things like a Comdex score, AM Best, Fitch's, um, is it called Moody's? Is there another one? Called Moody's, Standard Moody's? Poor. Yes. Okay. I was going to combine the two. So Moody's and then separately Standard & Poor. So when you have those financial ratings, they rate the financial strength or the health of a, um, of a life insurance company and their long-term stability and viability of staying in operation. And they're measuring specifically a lot of financials, but one of the things they're looking at is the contingency fund. And so it's important for you as the owner of a life insurance policy to recognize the strength of the company that you're working with, because as you're making your determination about your future financials, that rests upon the strength of the financial, the, it rests upon the strength of the life insurance company. And you want to make sure that they are strong so that they are going to be able to pay out their dividends and future death claims. And that's why we work with only the best. Most of them are very strong, but there are the ones that are the cream of the crop that we're making sure that we work with. Yeah, it's uh it's uh interesting. One of my one of my um contracts from the 80s actually went through a demutualization process and so they're now a stock company. I still have it. Um they no longer pay dividends, but they pay the guaranteed interest and I've had it for such a long time that it just makes sense to hang on to it. Contingency fund can all also be called the reserve fund. And what happens is, well, as you mentioned, you have expenses and you have uh, the CIO, the chief investment officer is taking the premiums and they're putting them to work mainly in safe investments. Why? Because that's part of the regulatory uh, environment. And then anything that's left over at the end, they decide to actually enhance the uh, reserve fund even more, and then and then they declare a dividend uh, to the pool of policyholders at that time. And uh, the ones that are in the top ten mutual companies, they have they actually average having seven percent more of a reserve fund than what is required. The company that we use the most actually has double that reserve fund. They have 14% more. And it's what's interesting in, in this world of numbers, people are always looking at what, what is the dividend crediting rate? Uh, but they they look at the, the Comdex score, which is a culmination of averages of everything you already said, Rachel, as far as the Moody's and the 
and the Finch and the uh, Standard Poor and so on and so forth, and they may, they come to an average of all those. Um, you can actually you can actually boost that up from other aspects of your business. So you might boost it up from your annuity business. You might bo- boost it up from other financial services business. You have to look at that with a company. How do I know that? Because my company that demutualized did the same thing. And another major carrier uh, that didn't have a great Comdex score, but one that was acceptable, recently de- demutualized three years ago. And they didn't get in trouble because of their whole life. They got in trouble because of their annuity business. So you also have to look to see how they're boosting up their dividend. And then you also have to look at you mean maybe boosting it's up better. Their, you mean boosting up their Comdex score? Is that is that right? No, boosting up okay. their dip. You have to look at it. They were using they were using proceeds from the annuity company to boost up their dividend. Oh I, yes, I see. Okay. Okay, and um, but ultimately they they uh, cut over their skis, as we say, and they were holding their annuities um, returns way too high, and the reserve requirement became so low that they had to do something. Well, the only thing they could do then was to demutualize to become a stock company. When you become a stock company, you have an influx of money coming in so that you can get your reserve requirements up. So that is how that is how that works as far as making sure a company's Comdex score is not only high, but also you need to look at how they're keeping that Comdex score high and what kind of investments they're currently making. Insurance companies are really good at making long-term investments. However, there's being more and more pressure put on mutual companies to actually keep their dividend higher in a relatively low interest rate environment because they, they're competing with monies going to other places. And when you really dive into those insurance companies and see what they're doing, you're seeing that they're, they're doing short-term gains, but eventually it, they will have to adjust because of their pool of money that they put aside for reserves. That is all part of what we do in evaluation of our company. We we like companies that have more reasonable dividends, even if it's less than the competition, for two that's reasons. Key. One, That's key. What that means is we may choose a company that has a lower projected dividend rate than another company. Right. And not because the Hear other that. company is necessarily going to go out of business. And not not necessarily because the other company is going to demutualize, but I've seen through my career, the higher you keep the dividend relative to your competition, you are doing something that is more dangerous than what the, your competition's doing. How do we know this? Because they're because they have to have investments that are safe. Well, those investments are offered to everybody: treasury bills, bonds. Corporate corporate bonds, mortgage backed securities. So it's not like they're they're suddenly going to make this great investment that nobody else is going to know about to keep that dividend up. So what they're doing is artificially keeping it up and supplementing it with other aspects of their business that is not from the mutual life insurance company. It's from their annuity company, it's from the other financial services companies, so on and so forth. So that what that means is the projection is too high and it will have to be adjusted into the future. And then the company that is more conservative, as the interest rate environment stays higher, they're going to actually have a, a tailwind and their projections were lower, but they're actually going to take off into the future. Mm-hmm. We're going to talk about that in the next section of dividends, how because that's the next definition. I was going to say, that's probably a great lead-in. I know you have a lot to cover with dividends as well. So um, let's go ahead and move into that definition. And this is dividends, probably one of the things that is most attractive to somebody who's coming into infinite banking, realizing that you can have this growing pool of capital within your whole life insurance policy based on the cash value accessible to you. And it's growing with guaranteed interest and non-guaranteed dividends. 
I say non-guaranteed because they are not guaranteed, but they are highly expected and anticipated because the companies that we work with as well have been paying dividends for multiple centuries and through the Great Depression, through the most difficult financial times when all other companies were having to be very constrictive, they still were able to pay those non-guaranteed dividends. Now, here's the definition that Nelson lays out. The earnings of a life insurance policy. So earnings, not of the company now, the earnings of a life insurance policy. You are the policyholder when you have a policy or a contract with that insurance company. This is your earnings that are paid to you. The earnings of a life insurance policy based on, so here's what it's based on, the company's mortality, expense, and investment experience during the year. That's the base definition. And then he elaborates and he goes on to say, when dividends, which are these earnings of your life insurance policy that you own, and these are added to your policy, when dividends are used to buy additional paid up insurance at no cost to the owner, the cash value of the additions becomes guaranteed at that time. There's a lot packed into that as well. This value will increase with time, but cannot decrease. What's very interesting about what Nelson is saying here is that you as a policy owner are being paid that guaranteed interest and non-guaranteed dividends. Those non-guaranteed dividends, when they come into your policy, you can use them in multiple ways. One of those ways is to purchase additional paid up insurance, which means this is a payment coming from the insurance company to your policy, and now that is not being directed just to pay out directly to you. What are you doing with that dividend once it is received in your policy? If it's used to buy additional paid up insurance, it's not only increasing your insurance that you have, but it's also being added to your cash value. And that's why it's setting a new floor and you cannot have your cash value drop below that in the future. So it's doing a lot of good and and further accelerating the growth of your policy and adding in that um, that momentum of compounding where not only do you have the policy growing, but you have the interest and the dividends and all of that cash value interest and dividends are also growing the next year and you're getting dividends on those dividends. And each time those dividends are purchasing more paid up insurance, it's adding to your cash value and to your death benefit. So a lot of power is coming from that dividend that is being paid. Now, Bruce, we're going to direct over to you. You've got a lot to cover on what definitions in fact are. Yeah, here's here's the thing. Uh, because we live in a world that is always based upon numbers and rates of returns and so on and so forth, people look at dividends as a rate of return and it is not a rate of return. It is Absolutely. simply it is simply a declaration of interest crediting to the pool of money that the policyholders have. And so I thought the best way to make sure that uh, this gets clarified is to not to give you a rambling, de my definition, but to read from a couple of different mutual companies because they have thought about this for literally centuries. and. They have had, you know, uh, uh, boardrooms who have thought this really, really well through. So the first part is a dividend is a, is a return of premium. This is something that pe people, this is a classification of return of premium. People that do not like whole life right away say, this is silly. This is meaningless. A dividend is just they're overcharging you and then they're just returning the premium to you. That's what a dividend is. And I've mentioned this on the podcast before. Yeah, it's the same thing as Coca-Cola or UPS. They're actually, they actually uh, declare dividends for their stockholders. So what that means is that they have excess profit, which means they, they uh, charge too much for the Coca-Cola and the UPS services than they needed to. And they're, they're, that's excess profit. So then they're returning it to the stockholders. It's the same thing. Now, what people are, what, what they're trying to, to be negative about is, see, you're only getting your money back. You're not getting anything greater than that. Well, all you have to do is look at a contract that has an illustration in it. And you, you look at your cumulative, 
your cumulative premium, and then eventually your cash value is greater than your cumulative premium. So if all they're doing is giving your premium back, then that would never happen. You, mm-hmm. Your premium and your cash value would be the same. So premiums right. for a dividend paying whole life and policy are determined using conservative mortality, interest, and company expenses assumptions. The, the company we're talking uh, with right now, we're going to say agnostic. When reviewing the company's operating results each year, may declare a dividend when the operating results are better than the assumption. And as Rachel's already pointed out, all the companies we use have paid a dividend for at least 118 straight years through all those hard um, economic times. But, but because of the law and regulations, they must tell people dividends are not and cannot be guaranteed. Now, the great thing about it is, is what Rachel was reading in Nelson's book, and Nelson says is used to buy more paid up additions at no cost to the owner. I want to clarify that. It doesn't mean that there's no cost to the additional paid up insurance because you do have a cost of insurance. What Nelson is saying is there's no cost for that process and there's no cost now for those dividends to become get the parts of the guarantees. So I'm going to be really clear on this. A dividend is not guaranteed, but once a dividend is declared and applied, it is now guaranteed for the life of the contract. So oftentimes when we meet with new people, they say, well, the dividends are not guaranteed, so I'm not going to base my decision on the the dividend side, the non-guaranteed side, I want to base my decision on the guaranteed side. Now, that doesn't make any sense to me, and I tell them that because, yes, there may be a historical reason that one or two years in the future, dividends will not be declared. However, to base your entire performance on the guaranteed side, where historically uh, these companies haven't even missed a, a dividend crediting payout. And so then you should say to yourself, well, then that probably means even if I miss one or two, that 98% of these dividends are going to happen. Mm -hmm. And once they happen, they're going to be guaranteed. So you're, it's going to go into the guaranteed side. Can I, I'm going to try to say this in a way that might understand that. I'm just going to reiterate what you just said in a way that I hope will be clear for somebody who maybe is not as familiar with this concept because it can get a little confusing. There are two sides of an illustration, guaranteed, non-guaranteed. On the guaranteed side, they show only interest being applied to the policy every year. It's only growing with interest. On the non-guaranteed side, they show a dividend being added to the policy at today's dividend projections and they use that projected amount of dividend every year going forward. Now, what Bruce is saying is if somebody says, well, dividends aren't guaranteed, I'm not going to look at the non-guaranteed side of the illustration, which performs higher on the on the basis of those dividends that are not guaranteed. So they revert then to saying, well, I'm just going to look at the guaranteed side of the illustration. You need to remember the guaranteed side of the illustration illustrates no dividend ever being paid. So when Bruce is saying this is never going to happen, what he's meaning and what he's saying is that the non guarantee or the guaranteed side of the illustration is the lower performance based on guaranteed interest only. It assumes on that side of the illustration that zero dividend in any year of your policy, starting now, going all the way to the end of your policy will never be paid into the policy. And on that basis, we say that's never going to happen. Even if one time or two times a dividend was not paid, you would still have much higher performance than what's on your guaranteed side of the illustration. I don't know if that's adding clarity. Sometimes you need to see in order to understand what we're communicating. Um, We have more on this in some of our courses. We don't have the capability to show that and illustrate that today in this podcast, but I just want to be clear on what is different about those two sides of the illustration. Very good. So how is the dividend scale interest rate calculated? The interest rate used in a dividend calculation is based upon the average yield of all the investments within a insurance company. The dividend scale 
interest rate is not a rate of return by the policy that the policy owner will earn and cannot be calculated by comparing the premiums paid into a policy to the policy's cash value and dividends. In other words, you see this a lot on social media. A person says, this company declared a 6% dividend and you're borrowing at 5.5%. See, you're making more money than you're actually borrowing. Mm. That is because they're, they are actually, they either they don't understand or they are deceiving people. They're saying that every year your cash value is going to grow by 6%. And that's just not going to happen. And it's not going to be happen because it's not a rate of return. This is actually for the entire block and each individual policy owner, holder, excuse me, actually gets a different crediting into their policy based upon when they put that policy into place. And this is because of the time value of money. So example is every whole life insurance policy that it comes from a mutual company goes through a process called endowment where the cash value and the death benefit are going to meet most companies that meets at age 121. Occasionally a company will be age 120 and years ago it was at age 100. They they've changed it to age 120 or 121. Now, if you can picture this, a two-year-old has 119 years to get to age 121, where a 60-year-old only has 61 years to get to age 121. So a two-year-old's crediting on its cash value for the dividend is going to be less than the 61-year-old. The 61-year-old is going to get a higher crediting into the cash value because they have less time for that to compound and get to the te- the death benefit. So mm-hmm. you can't think of dividends as a rate of return for your individual policy. It's a rate of return declared for the pool of that. And there, well, I'm going to I'm going to talk about that here in a second. But there's no industry standard on how that crediting is determined. Some of it do it do it net of expenses. Some of it do some companies do it gross of expenses, and some people and some companies do have some expenses come out, but not all the expenses come out. So there's no industry standard, and I know that's frustrating, but that's just the way it is. Um, so and I I can read the go ahead, Rachel. Just to recap on what you just said, it's really important to recognize a dividend rate declared by an insurance company is not a rate of return for your policy. And so anybody who says that is going to be misleading you to think inaccurately about your policy. If you really were to try to figure out a rate of return, which is very challenging and difficult type of calculation on an insurance policy, you would need to look at the premium paid in and the cash value at the end of every single year through your entire policy and then look at at the very end of the policy or at some point in the future, 20, 30 years out, what your cash value is based on the growth that it's achieved through dividends and interest, what rate of return would be required to have earned that based on the inputs and the total premium that you've paid in. It would be a a calculation. We can do that calculation based on historical performance of an actual policy, but it's difficult to make projections going forward into the future because you don't know if interest is going to rise or fall. The, The interest that is being paid on policies, you don't know if dividends, maybe they're declared at a lower rate now and they're going to increase with that particular insurance company in the future and have more dividends be paid than projected on an illustration. The value of an illustration is that you're getting a snapshot or an idea of what this policy could perform like, but it's not a guarantee of future performance. And so there's a lot of uh, misleading and misguiding when it comes to the rate of return on an insurance policy. All of that to be said, it's really important to understand that a dividend rate is not an internal rate of return. Bruce, go ahead with... um, the next piece that you were leading into, I think with how dividends are calculated within insurance companies. 
yeah, um, this is happening uh, greatly right now because people can't figure out, well, wait a minute, interest rates have gone up the last 18 months. Why haven't my dividend rates gone up a lot? And I can I understand how it's frustrating, but you have to understand is that insurance companies are in this for the long haul. I mean, they're looking at 100 plus years. <clears throat> so when they have a book of business, like a 30-year treasury or 10-year treasury or a 20-year treasury or even a one-year treasury, they have a block of business and it's rolling off every year. So the block of business right now is rolling off from 30 years ago, from 29 years ago to 28 years ago. Every year it's rolling off. Well, there's a combination of 30 years ago, that that interest rate environment was pretty good. Then you had, if you had uh, companies that were buying 20-year treasuries, that that interest rate was still pretty good. But now if you're looking at coming on 10-year treasuries or five-year treasuries or one-year treasuries, they're rolling off. That that actually is better now that they're rolling off because those are at low interest rate environments, and now they're buying at higher interest rate environments. And remember, there's an inverse relationship between the value of a bond and its interest rates. So if interest rates go up, Bonds that are already in place at a lower interest rate, they are actually going to go down in value. If if bond values go down, then any bond purchased before that had a higher interest rate, or the value of them is going to be go up on the open market because you can go up and say, hey, or going out in the open market and say, hey, I I know interest rates are three percent now, but I have a five percent bond that still has five years of maturity to, to to maturity who wants to buy this bond and people will give you a premium for that bond because it has a higher interest rate than what they can they can actually get today so the 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 ceo is always trying to establish and look at what is rolling off the books and what is coming onto the books and that's how they determine the amount of interest crediting they can have along with the mortality expenses, home office expenses, and so on and so forth. So knowing all that, then it every insurance company, you can go to their website and look at their dividends. And every one of the insurance companies is going to say there is no industry standard for calculating the div- dividend interest rate. <clears throat> so that's why you cannot compare dividends. There is no industry standard for calculating a dividend scale interest rate. This company I'm reading from right now, scale interest rate is net of investment expenses and default default costs. Yet another company may show gross numbers in this rate. The dividend scale interest rate is only one factor used in the calculation. And if we don't know the other factors, it's not a very meaningful number for comparing the overall value of a product. And that so is why you decisions. should not. Yeah, go ahead, Bruce. You should not be making decisions by looking at illustrations and saying, "Oh, twenty years from now, this company shows I'm going to have twenty more thousand dollars of cash value." Well, the one thing we know over the next twenty years is that illustration is going to be wrong several times. It may be better. It may be worse but it's going to be wrong. So you cannot use those comparisons. But we as humans, we feel the need to justify everything. And so we look at something with numbers and say, oh, this number is higher than that number, so that number must be greater. Well, it's li- it's like liar's poker. You know, it's the same way when somebody projects a stock and they say, well, the P-E ratio is this, so I project in 10 years it's going to be that. And then some regulatory uh, risk or, or geopolitical risk comes in about, and it doesn't happen. So just remember that this is not, there's no industry standard. So uh, as I continue, it says a higher dividend scale interest rate declared by a company may not translate into a higher long-term cash value or death benefit. It is possible that company with a lower declared dividend scale interest rate 
may have a higher dividend. Okay. And once again, what they're saying there is that the declared dividend rate, even though it's lower, they can actually apply higher to particular policies because of the other factors I already mentioned. So please, it's great to understand dividends. It's great to understand that dividends are good for you, but you cannot use them as a end-all, be-all on your decision-making process because there's no industry standard when calculating them. So what that really means, or what that shows me, is that if dividends or the declared dividend rate is not the best thing to make decisions on, then what is, right? What is the best thing to make decisions on? It's the fundamentals of infinite banking. It's recognizing that if I pay premiums into a life insurance policy that's designed properly for my benefit and for my growth, what's going to happen is that I'm going to have a death benefit based on the premium I'm putting in. I'm going to have a death benefit. I'm also within a properly structured whole life insurance policy that's dividend paying. I'm going to have a growing cash value. And that cash value is accessible cash that I can use during my lifetime. And when I have that growing ex access to cash, it's going to grow based on dividends and interest, interest and dividends, I should say it in that order. And because it's growing, I can use this capital. I'm becoming the banker because I'm storing liquid capital that I can access and use based on policy loans based on contractual guarantees of you as the policy holder and the policy owner, you can access capital against your cash value. You have guaranteed access to loans that you can pay back on your terms. That puts you in a position of control. When you look at that as a fundamental, as a, as a system or as the construct, the entire framework upon which we're making infinite banking decisions, the best thing that you can do is to say, if you value having capital and being able to use cash and use money in your life, then you would want to store it in the best way possible. And this is the best way that we've seen possible to be able to have access to your capital and have all these additional benefits and have capital that grows not just for you during your lifetime, but that produces a death benefit that when that pays out is significantly higher than the premiums you've placed in which makes it a wonderful tool for long-term generational wealth as well, because that death benefit is going to pay out to whoever you've determined as your beneficiary. And if that's your children, they're, the death benefit they receive is going to be significantly higher than everything that you've put in, in terms of premium during your lifetime. And because of that, you're in, in a position that you are moving wealth forward into their hands so that they have even more to start with than you did. And so when I look at infinite banking, I like to zoom way out to the big picture. And why would we make the decision to do this in the first place? If it sounds like when we zoom in close, it sounds like, well, there's a lot of unknowns and a lot of things that are on illustrations that are not going to show up exactly as they're illustrated. It's because when we look at the wrong thing and we try to, mm, I'm going to try to say this in the best way possible. I'm, I'm learning this concept as widescreen versus full screen. I, full screen. I'm sure you've heard this before, Bruce, but I did not realize that when you look at a widescreen movie and you have those black bars on top and the bottom, it's because it's showing you the full scope of everything that was recorded all the way to the edges. But when you look full screen, they chop off those edges. So you're actually not seeing what was on the periphery and you're zooming in closer. And the problem is when we zoom in closer, we think we're seeing more because the whole screen is covered with the movie that we're watching. But when we zoom in so close and we say, well, dividends is our main thing that we're looking at. And we, we're looking at a full screen view of just dividends. We're missing the wide angle or the wide screen view that shows us the entire landscape, which is how do you retain that banking function and be in a position of making the best financial decisions, not just looking at one number. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> um, Nelson publicly said that um, he actually messed up. I mean, we're talking about the father of the infinite banking system. And at one time, tap, tapped out about 44 or 45 policies. I can't remember the exact number. Uh, not only on his life, but on all his children and grandchildren. I was just saying, and that's a he, lot of policies. He even 
missed PUA payments, paid up addition payments, which caused his his PUA rider to close. And what he said was he didn't any any had all base policies early on. And what he said was he they still performed beautifully for the banking function in his life. They still they still accumulated cash value. They still were able to have all the other characteristics, even though they didn't have the PUAs. And in my case, I no longer get dividends from the one company, and I still have it because it still has the interest, and I built it up. I've stored so much capital in it since the 80s. It's still a wonderful place to have capital. Mm -hmm. And so it's not about the rate of return. And Nelson hits home on this all the time. It's about the process. It's about your your discipline. Just like it is to be disciplined to save first in a bank, a regular commercial bank. If you cannot do that, then it doesn't make any difference what an insurance company does. So it's all about the process of saving. It just so happened, Nelson, we've already laid this out, saving in a mutual company has so many other characteristics. So I mm-hmm. think uh, I, I think we probably beat that one to death. So we oh, can probably I'm sure we did. On. I'm sure we did. But we can't leave that without giving credit to Mike Michalowicz for the term profit first. If you're familiar with those books, it exactly encapsulates that idea of saving before you spend and having that system of savings. Uh, Bruce, we have time perhaps for one or two more here. The next definition. Yeah, the next one's easy. Entity. Something that has independent or separate existence. What does that mean? That means separate from you. That could be a banking entity. That could be a business entity. That could be another human. But you have something that is not a part of the same existence. Bruce, any any thoughts you want to share? Yeah, in this case, I would say, what's the purpose of the money? That's a separate entity. In this case, life insurance would be separate from if you had a, a brokerage account or savings account. They're all separate entities. And and within the insurance companies, you have separate entities because you have uh, different types of insurance companies, whether a stock or mutual companies. You also have different types of insurance, so every entity would be slightly different. Different, so pretty pretty easy uh, concept to understand. So I think we can go to the next one. Finance a little bit more difficult. All right, finance. This is Webster's definition. There is a noun and a verb. A noun is a person, place, thing, activity, or idea. So here's the noun version. The system that includes the circulation of money, the granting of credit, the making of investments, the provision of banking facilities. That is the thing that finance is. Now here's the verb, the action portion. Um, There's a formal definition of verb that includes more than just um, shows an action. It's also a state of being. But this is, if we think of a verb as being action-oriented, this is a little bit more helpful here. To provide with necessary funds in order to achieve a desired end. So that's the action of providing necessary funds to achieve a desired end. And then Nelson adds in, which is a brilliant concept added right here. This is his parentheses. You finance everything you buy. He's talking about finance, the verb form, the action of financing. You finance everything you buy. You either, and this is how you finance everything you buy, you either are paying, you either pay interest to others or you give up interest that you could have earned elsewhere. So the real um, learning here is to recognize that you are in the business of financing, whether you like it or not. So you are always financing. You are doing the providing with necessary funds to achieve a desired end. You are doing that for your groceries every week. You're doing that for every car you purchase. You're doing that for your the homes that you buy, every investment property, every business uh, decision that you make. You are financing. You are acting as that verb, providing with necessary funds to achieve that desired end. And in order to do that, you need to think about the source of your capital and whether you are paying interest by borrowing capital or you are giving up the ability to earn interest by paying cash. And there is a better solution than either of those. That's being a wealth creator by storing capital and borrowing against it. So I'm going to leave it there. There's so much more to disclose and discover, but Bruce, what are your thoughts on finance? No, I think, uh, no, 
I could care less what the the book definition is or the dictionary definition. I think in a form of finance, uh, Nelson uh, coming to the realization that you finance everything. And I, I applaud people that pay for things in cash. I wish our, I wish our not United States government was more like that. Um, but they are giving up something. They are giving up something. And what they're giving up is the ability to earn money on that particular money. So they are financing it uh, one way or another. All right, Bruce. Let's let's leave it there today. We are just about to the top of the hour. Um, Fritz, thank yeah. you for your additional great comments. I was just going to say, can we just go acknowledge yeah. Fritz for yep, today? Because he was he was trying to participate, and we and we um, we appreciated Fritz. Um, he asked about uh, whether we have ever spoken about discretionary participation features. And that's basically, no, I don't think we have, but that's basically that the contracts gives the company the ability to determine how they are in their discretion, how they're actually going to uh, give people the benefits of that contract. And in the case of a whole life contract, it would be they have the discretion how they're going to declare the dividend and how they're going to apply the dividend. So both things, how they're going to declare it and how they're going to apply it. You can have discretionary participation features in other contracts. It basically just is a catch-all for saying, hey, we are still in control of this contract. And and within the contract language, we still have some discretion to how that happens. If you ever have a trust, you will have a lot of discretionary features in a trust that they will say, it's up to the trustee, but here are the guidelines. You know, we we believe it it should be this, but the the trustee has some discretion on how they're going to allow that to be run. And then Fritz, um, thank you for pointing out about there's no guarantee on the PE ratio will go up, and it all takes is taking a gamble based on historic models and cash flows of the company. I agree with that. It's funny though. It's in the in the securities world, um, they're always looking at historicals. But then I, I've actually said this to some clients. They say, well, I just want to know what the company's uh, guaranteed rate is because I'm not going to look at historicals. And then I say, well, what do you base it upon your, your brokerage account, your individual account with all your stocks and bonds? What are you basing that upon? And they'll say, well, the historical returns of that company. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. Why are you doing it on historical returns based on the stock market, but you're not doing it on the historical returns based upon the insurance? Um, and it's just because, and this is what Nelson says, you have to rethink your thinking. Why are you thinking like that? And I think it's because it's a newer concept to a lot of people, even though it shouldn't be, because this is much older than the stock market. Mm. So thanks, for Fris, for everything. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Fritz, for um, all your participation and jumping in and um, all of the comments as well. So thank you for being with us on the show. Thank you to everyone else who's been tuning in live. I'm going to go ahead and close this out here. If you are listening to this right now and you are having that twinge in your mind, in your heart of knowing there is something to this infinite banking, I've been looking into it for a while. I am very curious. I have a lot of information. I think I understand. I really want to move forward and make a decision in my financial life because I want my financial future to be better than my past. I want a better place to store cash. I want to create that capital inside of my own banking system so that I can utilize this capital for my business, for my family, for future generations, that you're in a position that you really want to use the infinite banking concept because you want to take that banking function into your own hands and not just be a customer of the bank, but you want to do banking and be in control of capital. We would love to talk with you. You can book a call by going to themoneyadvantage.com and you can get on our advisor's calendar. And what this allows you to do is really to be able to look at your financial landscape, the financial picture of what you're bringing to the table in terms of what your income is, what your where your assets are sitting, what 
you can do to optimize your financial life, to get more cash flow and to increase your net worth and be in a position that you're making the best financial decisions so you have the most money to use today and in the future. We would love to be part of that conversation for you. This could involve infinite banking and it could involve even more than that in terms of looking at your financial life and really wanting to make sure that you're optimizing, you're, you're in a position of being in the most tax advantaged position. You're making the best decisions for your financing. You're making the best decisions with asset ownership and investing. We would love to be able to be a part of that conversation to make sure that you are building your financial foundation on solid ground and that you're making the best decisions going forward. So you can book that call and start that conversation where we'll explore how we can help you accomplish those goals. You can do that by going to themoneyadvantage.com. So in closing, thank you again for being with us on the show. We look forward to being part of your journey as you are exploring infinite banking and really adopting a philosophy of money that is built on a solid foundation. So in closing, please remember success leaves clues. Model the successful few, not the crowd, and build a life and business you love. We'll see you next time.